for those of us who have been following the news lately, there's a lot of uh, coverage about the Philippines right now, uh, particularly because of some terrorist ISIS threat in the city of Marawi, which is in Mindanao. Um, so my presentation is going to cover why Mindanao, why was there a martial law declared in Mindanao, who is the target, who stands to gain, and what is at stake. So if you go by the narrative that's being popularized in the media right now, it's why in Mindanao? Because there's an armed conflict in Mindanao. Because there are terrorists in Mindanao. And particularly in Marawi, where there is ISIS, no? There is this group called the Maute group that has claimed allegiance to ISIS and now is, has put Marawi under siege. Um, and who stands to gain? Let's see what According to the media, Duterte stands to gain from this, the president, Duterte. And what is at stake? Uh, national security is at stake because this is a terrorist threat. No. So um, I will try to ex objectify what's actually happening in Mindanao and why it's happening and why this martial law declaration is not, uh, not about terrorism, it's not about ISIS, it's about an ongoing armed revolution that's been going on for 50 years. Um, so Mindanao is the southernmost, so the red over there is Mindanao. It's the southernmost of the Philippine Islands, the three main island areas, Luzon in the north, the Visayas in the middle, and Mindanao in the south. Um, it is, uh, there are three general peoples in Mindanao. There are the Moro or the Bangsa Moro. There are the Islamicized indigenous peoples of the lowlands. There are the Lumads. Uh, the Lumads are both, the Moros are 13 ethno-linguistic tribes. So they don't all speak the same language. Um, the Lumads are 18 ethno-linguistic tribes. They're also indigenous, but they are in the mountains. They're up on the hinterlands. And then there are the Christian settlers. Those who are really not from Mindanao, they just came in and settled. Um, and so in Mindanao, you will find the poorest um, provinces in the whole of the Philippines. In fact, where the Maute group operates, Lanao del Sur, or Marawi is in Lanao del Sur, which is the, technically the poorest province in the whole Philippines. So you find uh, crushing poverty there, crushing landlessness, and a lot of uh, social unrest. And in these types of situations, you usually find armed conflict. Okay. Um, so Mindanao, I said earlier, well, maybe I didn't say it, is um, it's the part of the Philippines where you find the largest, densest concentration of natural wealth. It's the food basket of the country. It's also the food ba one of the food baskets for the region, the Asia Pacific region. Um, and so in Mindanao, you will find um, big, corporate, multinational corporations who are invested in mining, who are invested in agribusiness, who are invested in, um, uh, in extraction. So these pictures here is the one on the top is a whole, is a big vast marshland called the Liguasan Marsh. The Liguasan Marsh has the deepest deposits of natural gas in Mindanao and also is also an oil reserve. And this is where, this is where Marawi is. This is where the terrorist threat is. The siege is happening where this Laguasan Marsh is. And then on the bottom is a, it's an open pit mine uh, because Mindanao is also the mining capital of Asia. Um, so you find big open pit mines um, in the Caraga region of Mindanao, which is the north. And then over there are fruits. So you will find um, foreign corporate agribusiness, especially um, tropical fruits. Uh, those businesses are there. Food, food corporations are in Mindanao. So Dole, Del Monte, they all have big corporate plantations in Mindanao. Next. Uh, so plunder of resources is a, you know, it's, it's an imperialist threat, no? It's an imperialist attack against the people there because big corporate, big monopoly capitalists, big multinational corporations, uh, and big imperialist powers go to Mindanao to plunder and to commit development aggression. And they usually uh, hire um, private armies to clear out and strafe the communities there for them to be able to conduct their operations. So there's also the largest presence of U.S. troops in the who are in the Philippines in Mindanao. There's also the largest presence of AFP, of Philippine military. There's 60% of the Philippine military is deployed in Mindanao. Um, and, and conversely to that, Mindanao is also where you have the largest deployments of the NPA, the New People's Army, which is the Revolutionary People's Army that's fighting, has been fighting against U.S. imperialism for the past 
50 years, no? So these are pictures of Bangsamoro uh, liberation leaders. So like I said earlier, the Bangsamoro people, because they're Islamicized, and um, uh, they, are, they face heavy, heavy discrimination from a predominantly Catholic chauvinist government. So even during the, the US, from the time of um, 1898, during the Spanish, uh, during the Philippine-American War, the US has never been able to fully subjugate, conquer, uh, and Christianize the Moro people. Because their civilization is that strong. They have their own developed armed def defense units already. In fact, there was a gun developed by the US military just to kill a Moro because they couldn't kill a Moro at, at, at far range. They had to basically, uh, if you shoot a Moro from far, he will just keep running towards you. So they had to develop a, a special gun, the caliber 45, to be able to kill a Moro at close range. So that's where that gun comes from, you know? Uh, because the, the Moro will really, he will get close to you, or she will get close to you, so they had to kill them at close range. Uh, so, the, I'm sorry, before you, before you, so the, 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 the leaders on the top, um, the one on the left is uh, Nora Miswari. Nora Miswari, uh, in the 1960s, founded the Moro National Liberation Front. So because of years and years of foreign uh, intervention and national oppression, the Bangso Moro people have been fighting a struggle for self-determination to liberate themselves as their own nation against you know the forces their forces of oppression for centuries right so and this is an armed struggle it's an armed struggle so uh, Nora Misori founded the Moro National Liberation Front which was very much inspired by the third world nationalist movement in the 1960s during the great proletarian cultural revolution in China uh, so he founded um, what is now in the consciousness of the people as the Moro nation so it's a national liberation struggle. So he founded the MNLF as uh, their army to fight for national liberation of the Moro people. Um, Ferdinand Marcos declared martial law in 1972 and cited the armed Moro movement as the reason why. So um, uh, that, is, that led to uh, peace talks with the MNLF. And unfortunately, um, the MNLF capitulated to um, to the peace talks, to the Philippine government, to the Marcos dictatorship, and uh, signed an agreement. So they laid down their arms, because that's usually what, uh, that's what counterinsurgency is. You, you try to pacify the armed rebel groups, and you try to divide them. So that's what the peace talks with the MNLF, that was, that's what that was. It was a pacification campaign. It was a campaign to force the MNLF to capitulate. So they did, and that's why you have an armed Called, it's called the ARM, the Autonomous Region of Muslim Mindanao, which is what, um, which is, is their political autonomous region, which is, you know, not genuine. And then, so the MILF, or the Moro Islamic, Moro Islamic Liberation Front, did not agree with the laying down of arms. So they continued the armed struggle for Moro national liberation. But then recently, during the Aquino government, again, they also capitulated to another peace agreement because Ongoing counterinsurgency, the Moro area of Mindanao is a laboratory for U.S. counterinsurgency. It's actually where um, the Moro people were the first Muslims that the U.S. waged war on, you know, in history. So, um, so the Moro liberation struggle continues on as an armed struggle, even though there have been so many attempts to get them to capitulate. No one, so the groups now, you have to be able to distinguish who is actually fighting for the right to self-determination, who's actually part of the U.S. counterinsurgency campaign that is funded by the CIA, trained by the CIA, like this Maute group, like ISIS, like the Abu Sayyaf. These are not genuine uh, moral groups fighting for self-determination. They're, they're, they're waging sectarian violence funded by the CIA, uh, armed by the CIA. So you have to be able to distinguish those things. Now, but there is still a genuine moral struggle for self-determination that we respect and we recognize. And you have to be able to distinguish those groups. The media is telling you a different story. So the, uh, yes, you can keep going. So again, I said, um, Ferdinand Marcos de Carr's martial law, that's the actual headline in 1972, in September 1972, that's Jose Maria Sison uh, holding up a gun in the, in the 70s. And this is the New People's Army on the bottom. So um, Ferdinand Marcos cited the Moro conflict 
in Mindanao as the reason why he had to declare martial law. But the real reason why he had to declare martial law because there's a revolutionary movement in the country and it had grown so big by then that he needed to, uh, he needed to control it. So he declared martial law and his target was the NPA. It was not the Moros, it was the NPA that was the target. Because the NPA is waging a revolutionary struggle, mainly in the countryside, and the main content of this revolution is agrarian revolution. Meaning to say, taking back land from the landlords. Because there's no peace in the Philippines because there's, there are landlords. <laughs> as long as there are landlords, there's no peace in the Philippines. So, um, and imperialism, if we were really to understand it, its social base is a landlord class. Its social base is feudalism, no? Up until now, modern imperialism thrives because of the landlord class in its semi-colonies. So the New People's Army is a peasant army fighting for agrarian revolution with an anti-imperialist line. So Duterte, who comes from Mindanao, who is also of, of moral descent, uh, declared martial law. Why did he declare martial law? He, was, he is friends, he was friendly with the revolutionary movement when he was a mayor and even when he was a president because he resumed the peace negotiations between uh, the revolutionary government of the CPP, NPA, and, um, and the Philippine government. I have no defense for, for Rodrigo Duterte. I will say that there are drivers in his cabinet that are really pushing him and forcing him to toe the line of the neoliberals before him, of the judicial politicians before him, to declare martial law. There are 12 high-ranking, uh, former high-ranking Philippine army, Philippine military militarists in his cabinet. They'll, next, so, so sorry, no, la, la. go back, go back. So, uh, Rodrigo Duterte basically, um, really pissed off the U.S., right? When he resumed the peace talks between, um, between the GRP and the NDFP. It's okay. Um, so I, I just want to stress that when, when they resumed the peace talks, the peace talks have reached the point of the fifth round, which was recently uh, scrapped, didn't take place, but it reached four rounds. And in these four rounds, they reach an unprecedented level of negotiating basic socioeconomic reforms at the table, such as free land distribution. In a, in a semi-feudal country like the Philippines, that can actually pave the way for the eradication of poverty, uh, through free land redistribution. Um, and also national industrialization, so that you know, 6,000 Filipinos don't have to leave the country every day to look for work. Of course, this will really upset imperialism, and those who have big corporate investments in the Philippines, especially agricultural investments, mining, natural wealth, oil, um, and even cheap human resources. Um, so because of this opening of space of sorts with the peace negotiations, uh, the mass movement and the agrarian revolutionary movement were able to also make some, intensify and, and win some gains. So at this time, very recently, there were some victories for farmers and peasants all over Mindanao. Collective action led to uh, the reinstatement of land for, for poor farmers in, uh, in Mindanao that was grabbed by a big major food corporation, La Pantai Food Corporation. And so um, they were able to get it back because of the Department of Agrarian Reforms Secretary signed an order demanding that the farmers get their land back. So this is the pretext for right before the martial law was declared, okay? There were victories for farmers all over Mindanao, and there was also an intensification of, of uh, farm worker strikes all over Mindanao during the peace talks to intensify, you know, to build up, because the mass movement in intensifies when, there are, when there's an opportunity like the peace talks, no? And so because of the gains and the intensification of the mass movement, particularly the movement for agrarian reform and agrarian revolution in Mindanao, the, the militarists in Duterte's cabinet who are loyal to U.S., to the U.S., they are loyal to the U.S., pressured Duterte 
that they they will stage a coup or they will unseat him if he doesn't follow what their line is. So, um, and this was right before the fifth round of talks. So, just to show you how chaotic it was, the the Philippine delegation to the fifth round was there in, in Oslo, saying, and then they were told all of a sudden to, to go back to the Philippines and not participate in the peace talks. And the head of the delegation said this, this fifth round will only, it's only the fifth round that will be scrapped, but, uh, but the peace talks as a whole will not be canceled. So there will be future talks. Of course, at the same time, Duterte is saying in the Philippines, I will arrest all of the NDFP consultants that come back and I will throw them back in prison and I will let them die and rot there. So you see the conflicting um, statements coming from different members of the Duterte regime. So there are contradictions there for sure. Um, so I mean the so really at the core of this martial law is the threats to the landed oligarchy uh, in in the Philippines who want to maintain the status quo of semi feudalism which supports U.S. imperialism, and of course, uh, you know, declaring martial law is an old tactic, an old tool that the U, that the U, U.S. uses to to keep their hegemony over the Philippine economy. Next. So these are these two are two militarists in uh, Duterte's cabinet. Delphine Lorenzana on the top, who is the defense secretary, and to the bottom is uh, Eduardo Año, who is the Department of Interior and Local Government. And these two are the architects and the pushers of martial law now under Duterte. Oh, by the way, um, when asked why uh, why all of martial law is under martial uh, well, all of Mindanao is under martial law. It was Lorenzana that said because of the because there's also the NPA in Mindanao. So in other words, it's not just ISIS in Marawi. Marawi is just one city, you know, in in one province in Mindanao. But why lump the NPA, which is a member of the National Democratic Party, which the Duterte government has been having peace negotiations with? It doesn't make any sense. So. You can see that there was pressure on, 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 the, on Duterte coming from the, the right-wing militarists within his cabinet to go back to the traditional, traditional politics in the country, which is to tow the, the semi-colonial, semi-feudal line of, uh, of neo-colonial rule in the country. So this is um, a picture of uh, both panels together in happier times of the <laughs> peace process. They're all smiling and wearing white. Of course, now it's, you know, virtually canceled. Next. Um, and so these are the two flags, no? Uh, the, the side here is the Manila government, we call it the Manila government flag, no? The Manila government flag, which is recognized as the um, representative of the Filipino people worldwide. And then the flag to the right is the flag of the National Democratic Front. Uh, the NDF is, the, is mandated by um, the Provisional Revolutionary Government, which exists in uh, 71 out of the 81 provinces in the country. It's basically a revolutionary government born out of armed revolution, uh, armed struggle, that exists in the country and has its own territory, has its own uh, systems, um, has a healthcare system, has a justice system, has an education system. And is um, you know it exists in the countryside. And it's for the peasants. Um, so that's their flag. So the NDF is mandated to represent that provisional revolutionary government in the countryside. Next. So what are we saying? What are we, what are we saying? We're saying lift martial law now. Lift it. <laughs> Continue the GRP and the peace talks. Respect Bangsamoro right to self determination. Do I have time? Yeah. Okay, it's okay. it's half English, half Tagalog. Okay. okay. So uh, it's not imperialist but Ibaksak. It's even better. Um, so peace talks, peace talks, Itoloy. Itoloy means continue. Itoloy, say itoloy. Okay. Peace talks, peace talks, itoloy. Peace talks, peace talks, itoloy. Peace talks, peace talks, itoloy. Thank you very much. Oh.